Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah chapter 35. We're going to read. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. Uh, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice why joy in singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of uh, Carmel's and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not, behold your God will come with vengeance. With the re uh, recompensance, of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of waters. In the hound of Jekyll, where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes, and the highway shall be there, and it will be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall be passed over it, it shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even they are foals, they shall not go astray, no lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come up, uh, come up on it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the uh, rans ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighting shall flee away. Let's uh, take a look at from verse 1. The wilderness and a dry land shall be glad. The desert shall be rejoiced and blossom like the crocus. So when you look at this message, the joy and the gladness in the wilderness and dry land. This is the key part that you need to pay attention. When Jesus when Jesus Christ come, Jesus said, I came for sick people and people who are in need, not for pe people who already abundantly have something, right? People, the, the Jesus did not have to come for people who already have everything with the waters and the greens and nothing like that. Just to keep that in mind, when John the Baptist came, where did he come from? Where did he start his ministry? Let's turn to uh, Matthew for a second. Matthew chapter 3, it says, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Where did he start his ministry? Wilderness. Right? He started from the wilderness. And then, continue on, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of a one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Interestingly, he says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness. So, John the Baptist started his ministry from wilderness. And he start to preach. And as 
Matthew says, "The voice of one crying in the wilderness." Why did he start from the wilderness instead of starting from the city? Shouldn't he started from like Jerusalem, where everybody's you know the, there are lots of people there? Who's there in the wilderness? There's nobody there. You have to go to city to meet people. But why did John the Baptist start it from the wilderness? What's the point? And this is going back to Isaiah. It says the the wilderness. And the dry land shall be glad. Where do you meet the Lord? In the city or the wilderness? Where did people of Israel learn who the God is? They learned who God is. During the time of wilderness, right? If we feel that if we have something, we don't need God, we have to know that I don't have things so that I need something from the Lord, and that's when we seek the Lord. So we are the wilderness. We are the dry land. There's nothing, and we are waiting for the Lord. So this is the where we meet the Lord in the wilderness, in the dry land, and this is where we meet the Lord and shall be glad. The desert shall be rejoice and blossom like a crocus. This is where we meet the Lord. It shall. Blossom abundantly where, in the wilderness, in the desert, and rejoice with, with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of a Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the majesty of our God. Where do we actually see the glory of the Lord, and where do we where where do we realize the majesty of our God, in the wilderness, in the desert. In a dry land, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, "Be strong and fear not." Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense uh, uh, of God. He will come and save you. Why strengthen the weak hands? Because we're fearful. We don't have anything, so that we actually kneel down before the Lord and ask for His help. Because I cannot help myself. Lord will need to help me. This is why God is saying, "Strengthen the weak hands," because I can't do anything with my hands, and with my, I can't do anything because I don't have a strong legs. I don't have any things to fight. I don't have anything. So, when we become weak, this is when God said, "Be strong, because I am with you." This is why I kept said, in the during my Bible sharing, is that when you become weak, then you become strong. When you become strong, you could be weak, because God is not there with you. This is why we have to wash our hands and say, "Lord, I don't have anything. I can't do anything, Lord. It is you who always hold me up. You're the one who make me do things. And when we come to the Lord and ask for help, then you can do everything. And when we do that, then we will see the glory of the Lord, and we will see His Majesty of God." Then the eyes of the blind shall be open, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Does that sound familiar to you? 
when you read this? Anything that so it comes to your mind? Let's turn to uh, Matthew again. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. We're going to read from verse 2. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered him, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sights and the lame walk. Leapers are uh, cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are uh, raised up and the poor have good news preached to them and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. John is the one who baptized Jesus. And he was the one who prepared the way. And he was the one who actually said, one after me is the Messiah, which was a Jesus. Even he was the one who actually preached the people. When he was put in prison, he was questioning, are you the one or should we wait for another? He himself was questioning. So Jesus told the disciples of John and said, go back to John and tell him this. And what, what did Jesus tell, you know, tell him? The blind receive their sights, lame walk, leapers are cleansed, and the deaf we hear. So, coming back to Isaiah again, what, what did we read here? Same thing. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped, then shall... Uh, the lame man leaped like a deer. This is what Jesus will do. So then, this particular message in this Isaiah chapter 35 is almost portraying what Jesus will do. Jesus the Savior, what he will do when he comes. When he comes, the people in the desert, people in the wilderness, people in the dry land, will be glad and joy for singing. And he's the one who's going to actually heal the people and he's going to open the blind man. He's going to, you know, let the, uh, the deaf to hear and he's going to have the lame to walk and leaping like a, a deer. That's exactly what Jesus did. For waters break forth in the wilderness and stream, uh, streams in the desert. That living water will come out of the wilderness in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water in the hound of jackal where they lie down. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there. It shall be called the way of holiness. When John the Baptist came, what did he say? What was the first thing he said? Huh? What was his preaching? The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So he was preparing the way, right? When Jesus Christ came, what was his claim? I am the way. And then? Truth and a life. So who is the path? Jesus is the path and he is the way. That way is what? Is what we just read in verse 8 in Isaiah chapter 35. The highway shall be there and it shall be called the way of holiness. That's the way. 
Are there multiple ways to get to the Father? No, there's only one way, the highway. Highway and the way is Jesus. The unclean shall not pass over. Of course, no one can get to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Unclean, unless you are cleansed by the blood of the Jesus Christ, no one can get through it. No one can walk on that path. No one can, no one can find a way because Jesus is the only way. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way, which means anyone who walks through Jesus Christ is the one who will go through that path. So what is he talking about? He's talking about the ultimate salvation. Once again, the Isaiah is not really talking about the Jesus's, you know, the work. He's talking about how Israel will be restored and how they'll re- how they will be, you know, saved after they actually, you know, um, uh, the fall of the J- Jerusalem, and they're gonna just drag them to a Babylon as a captive, and then eventually they will return. So they're talking about the restorations of of the Father, but not only he's talking about the restoration of the Israel, but he's talking about the ultimate restoration, which is ultimate salvation. So the salvation that they received when they came back from uh, Babylon, that was just a symbolic representation of how Jesus will restore everything. So it's a double prophecy, as I just mentioned. It should belong to those who walk on the ways, even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, no, nor shall any uh, ravenous beast to come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. There's no beast, that there's no one is going to attack you. You'll be able to walk that way safely and sounding. And the rans- ransomed of the Lord shall return. The ransomed one, which is, I mentioned many times, as you know, as I described the Isaiah, those people who are ransomed are the one who are saved, not everyone. And come to Zion with singing, everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and singing shall flee away. So no more weeping, no more crying, no more tears, right? This is what Revelation was talking about. Let's go to Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as the bird adorned for her husband, a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. And they will be uh, be his people, and God Himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tears from their eyes. Death shall shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, mourning, nor crying, not pain any more, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Which means no more pain. No more tears, no more crying, no more sorrow, because we're now with the Lord and we'll be singing for gladness and for joy. So, ultimately, even though God will actually save the Israelites, this is not the only way that God is going to save. And another part we're going to just take a look at it here is it sh- it said going back to uh um 
verse 6 and 7, in the middle of verse 6, it says, The water breaks forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert, and burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground spring, springs of water. It should remind, you, remind of you of some things in the Bible. Waters in the wilderness. Of course, you will probably remember when Moses actually struck the rock to brought the, uh, the spring waters out of the rock. That's one thing. But there's, there's more. There are more waters coming and that turned the desert and the wilderness into a, a green place. Where do you see that kind of things in the Bible? Does that come to your mind at all, anyone? If you're not, then let's go to what e Ezekiel. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel chapter 47. We're going to read from verse 1 and on. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the um, temple towards the east, for the temple faced east. The water was a flowing from a flowing down from below the south uh, south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Then he brought me out by way of north gates and led me around on the outside of the outer gate and faced towards the east. And behold, the water was thickening out on the south side, uh, trickling, going on eastward. With the measuring line in his hand, the man measured a thousand cubits, and then led me through the waters, and it was ankle deep. Again, he measured a thousand, and led me through the water, and it was knee deep. Again, he measured a thousand, and led me through the water, and it was waist deep. Again, he measured a thousand. It was the river that I could not pass through, for the water has, had risen. It was deep enough, uh, deep enough to swim in, a river that could not be passed the, uh, the through. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river, and I went back. I saw on the bank of the river very many trees on the one side and the others. And he said to me, This water flows towards the eastern regions, and goes down into the Arabah, the enters the sea. When the water flow into the sea, the water of waters will become fresh. And whatever the uh, river goes, every living creature that swarms will live, and there will be very many fish. For this water goes there, that the water of the sea may become fresh. So everything will live where the river goes. Fishermen will stand beside the sea from Engedi to Enigline. It will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be of very many, many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. But its swarm and marshes will not become fresh. They, will, they are to be left for salt. And on the bank on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month every, uh, because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. Where is the water flowing from? From the threshing floor of the temple. So, if you know what the temple looks like, the door of the temple on the east side, it's always on the east side, but the Holy of the Holy is on the west side. 
Okay? So water is coming from the throne and started to come from the holy place, coming out to the uh, south part of the altar, and then coming out of the, the east gate, and then flowing down. And then where does it flow to? It flow from the En Gedi to Enegline. So where is En Gedi and where is Enegline? So let's take a look at some of the map. I actually showed you this before, but you may not actually uh, remember. So let's just take a look at the um, diagram one more time. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to use the All right, do you see my uh, screen? <clears throat> so this is Jerusalem. All right. In Jerusalem, that's where the temples is, right? So, let's assume the temple is in in Jerusalem here. The waters are coming out of a Jerusalem where the temple is. Waters are coming and then it's going to flow down to south. And this is En Gedi. This is En Gedi. So then what is this water? This is Dead Sea. This is a Dead Sea. And nobody really knows where Enegline. But Enegline will be on this side, most likely. Why? Because the waters are flowing from south going down and going eastward. So En Gedi over to the Eneg line and continue to flow over to the eastward. And then when waters are flowing, coming from the temple side and then go over to the Dead Sea. And what is he saying in Ezekiel? Going back to... Um, Chapter 47 and verse um, 6 and on. Then he led me back to the bank of the river, which is the Red uh, Dead Sea. As I went back, I saw on the bank of the river very many trees on the one side and the others. And he said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes into the Arabah and enters the sea. When the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. And wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live and there will be very many fish. For this water goes there and the water of the sea may become fresh. So everything will live there, uh, live where the river goes. The fishermen will stand beside the sea from Engedi to Enigleim. It will be a place for the spreading of nets. It's a fish will be of every many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. But its swarms and marshes will not become fresh. They are to be left for salt. And on the bank of both sides of the river, they will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit uh, fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. So, as the water flows through the Dead Sea, there will be a fish. The water will no longer be salty, but will be a fresh water. And there will be a lots of tree growing by the, by the sea. So, there will be a lot of a fish is going to live it. 
Right now, Dead Sea. What's there? What creature lives in Dead Sea? Nothing. Not even Valkyria can live in the Dead Sea because it's so salty. But when the water coming out of the sanctuary and water flow through the Dead Sea, it's gonna turn the Dead Sea, which is dead, one to come to living. This is one of the teachings that I mentioned from the beginning. God's works always a star from darkness to light, death to live. It's always the case. So Dead Sea is dead, but when the water comes from the sanctuary, when it flows through the Dead Sea, there will be a living things. There will be a fish, and the tree will grow. Let's take a look at this with the spine, and let's go to Revelation again. Revelation chapter 22. Revelations chapter 22, we're going to read from verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruits, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing for the nations. Does that sound familiar? Isn't that what we just read from Ezekiel? What was that, Revelation 1? Revelation chapter 22, from verse 1. I see, thank you. That's exactly the same story with what we just read from Ezekiel. Because the water, the living water is coming from the throne. Where would the, the living water is going to come from? From Jesus Christ. What does living water represent? That is the Holy Spirit. Right? The dead ones will come alive. The blind will see. Deaf will hear. And the lame will leaping. Because everything that are broken will be restored and healed. Who comes? When Jesus comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, that's everything will change. This is the teachings of the Isaiah. So coming back to Isaiah, chapter 36 now. So you, you could understand that chapter 35, it talks about is the way which is Jesus. His salvation is what has been actually taught in chapter 35. Chapter 36. Let me just stop this. Okay. In the 14th year of a King Hezekiah, uh, Sennacher uh, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified city of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent the uh, Rabshakeh from the Lachish of a king Hezekiah at Jerusalem with the great army, and he stood by the conduit of the upper pool on the highway uh, to the washer's field. And there came out to him Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the, uh, the household, and Shepna, the secretary, Joah, the son of Asap, the recorder. And uh, Rapsake said to them, Say to Hezekiah, Though says the great king, the king of Assyria, on what do you rest this trust of yours? Do you think that mere words as strategy and a power of a war? In whom do you now trust that you have rebelled against me? Behold, you are trusting in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff which will pierce the hand of any man who lean on it. 
Such is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he who, uh, whose high place and altar Hezekiah has removed a saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? Come now, make a um, wager with me, uh, with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able on your part to set rider on them. How then can you repulse a single captain among the least of my master's servants when you trust in Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Moreover, is it without the Lord that I have come up against this uh, land to destroy it? The Lord said to me, Go up against this and land and destroy it. Then Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah said to Rabsake, Please speak to your servant in Aramaic, for we understand it. Do not speak to us in the language of Judah within the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But the Rabshake said, Has my ma master sent me to speak these words to your master and to you, and not to the man sitting on the wall, who are doomed with you to eat their own dung and drink their own urine? Then the Rabshake stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. The city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make your peace with me, and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat of his own vine, and each one of his own fig tree, and each one of you will drink the water of his own cistern. Until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, Beware lest the Hezekiah misled you by saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hands of the king of Assyria? Where are the god of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of uh, Shepharvaim? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand, who among all the gods of these land have delivered their lands? Out of my hands, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. But they were silent and answered him not a word, for the king's command was, Do not answer him. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, and, uh, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asap, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the word of Rab, uh, Rabshakeh. So, this particular story, it's kind of a bring us back to the story of the second king, which we did not read, because we jumped from the second king, and as we were going through the second king, we jumped to uh, the book of uh, prophets. Now we're still going through the book of prophets, and we're in the middle of, uh, you know, reviewing the uh, book, uh, book of Isaiah, but this story kind of like insert into the story of the uh, uh, the second king. So let's turn to, uh, let's go back to the second king, chapter 18. Second king, chapter 18. <clears throat> so what we did was, we finished up to Second King chapter sixteen and jumped to the book of uh, a prophets, if you remember. So we went to Micah and now we're going over Isaiah. But now we're going back to uh, chapter eighteen, which we didn't cover yet. But let's just to kind of like read through and what it says. Second King chapter eighteen. In the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah king of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, the king of Judah, began to reign. 
He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, and uh, the daughters of Zechariah, and he did not. Uh, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that David, his father, had done. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Ezra, and he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made for until those days of uh, those the people of Israel had made offering to it. It was called Nebuchadnezzar. He trusted in the Lord and God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses, and the Lord was with them. Wherever he went out, he prospered. He rebelled against the king of Assyria, and would not serve him. He struck down the Philistine as far as Gaza and its territory from watchtowers to fortified city. In the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. And at the end of three years, he took it, in the sixth years of Hezekiah, which was the ninth years of Hoshea king of Israel, Samaria was taken. The king of Assyria carried the Israelites away to Assyria and put them in Hala and on the harbors, the river of Gozan, and in the city of the Medes. Because they did not obey the voice of the Lord their God, but Transgress his covenant, even all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded, they neither listened nor obeyed. In the fourteenth year of a king of Hezekiah, uh, Shennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified city of Judah and took them. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying, I have done wrong, withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. And the king of Assyria required of Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. At that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the door of the temple of the Lord and from the doorpost that Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria sent the Tartan, the Rab Saris, and the Rabsake, with a great army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. When they arrived, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pools, which is on the high, highway to the washers of field. And then they called for the king. There came out to them Eliakim, son of Hil, uh, Hilkiah, who was over the household of Shepna, the secretary, and jo uh, Joah, the son of Asa, the recorders. And the Rabshake said to them, Say to Hezekiah, Then say to the great king, the king of Assyria, On what do you rest this tr uh, trust of yours? Do you think that mere words are a, str uh, are a strategy and power for war? In whom do you now trust that you have rebelled against me? Behold, you are trusting now in Egypt that broken reed of a staff which will pierce the hand of any man who uh, lean on it, such as Pharaoh king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, We trust in the Lord our God, is it not, the who, uh, not he whose high places and uh, altar Hezekiah has removed the saying to Judah and to Jerusalem, You shall worship bef uh, before this altar in Jerusalem? Come now, make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able on your par part to set riders on them. How then can you repulse a single captain among the least of my master's servants when you trust in Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Moreover, is it without the Lord that I have come up against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. 
Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shapna and Joah said to the Rabshake, Please speak to your servant in Aramaic, for we understand it. Do not speak to us in the language of Judah within the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But the Rabshake said to them, Has my master sent me to speak these words to your master and to you and not to the man sitting on the wall, who are doomed with you to eat their own dung and drink their own urine? Then the uh, Rabshakeh stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria, though says the, uh, says the king, Do not let uh, uh, Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you out of my hand. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for though, says the king of Assyria, make your peace with me and come out to me, then each one of you will eat of his own wine, of own vine, and each one of his own fig tree, and each one of you will drink the water of his own cistern. Until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey, that you may live and not die. And do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you by saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hama and Arpad? Where are the gods of uh, Sheparvaim, Hannah and uh, Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hands? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their, uh, uh, their lands out of my hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. But the people were silenced and answered him not a word, for the king's command was, Do not answer him. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the house of household, and Shephna, the secretary, and Jonah, Ajoa, the son of Asap, the recorder came to Hezekiah with your clothes torn and told him the words of the Rabshake. Which is almost identical story that we just read from Isaiah. It's the same exact story that you just read. And this is not the actually the only place. So when you actually go to Second um, Chronicle chapter 32. <coughs> Second Chronicle. Chapter 32. It's the same stories recorded in Second Chronicle chapter 32. We're going to continue to read on to get the full picture of what's going on here. So it's a long story. We're reading the Bible, but just to keep that in mind and be able to put all the stories together so that you get the full picture, okay? After these things and these acts of faithfulness, uh, Shinacherib, the king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah and encamped against the fortified city, thinking to win them for himself. And when Hezekiah saw that um, Shinacherib had come and intended to fight against Jerusalem. He planned with his officer, with his mighty man, to stop the water of the springs that were outside the city. And they helped him. A great many people were gathered, and they stopped all the springs and the brook that flowed through the land, saying, Why should the king of Assyria come and find much water? He set to work, um, Resolutely and built up all the walls that was broken down and raised uh, towers upon it. And outside it, he built another walls and he strengthened the um, mellow in the city uh, uh, in the city of David. He also made uh, weapons and shield in abundance. And he set combat commander over the people and gathered them together to him in the square at the gate of the city and the spoke 
encouragingly to them, saying, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria and all the horde that is with him, for there are many with us than with him. With him is an army of flesh, but with us is the Lord, of, Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people took confidence from the work, word of Hezekiah, king of Judah. After this, Shennacherib, king of Assyria, who was besieging Lachish with all his forces, sent his servant to Jerusalem to Hezekiah, king of Judah, and to all the people of Judah who were in Jerusalem, saying, Though, says the uh, uh, Shennacherib, king of Assyria, on what are you trusting that you are endure the siege in Jerusalem? Is not Hezekiah misleading you that he may give you over to die by famines and by thirst when he tells you the Lord our God will deliver us from the hand of a king of Assyria? Has not this same Hezekiah taken away his high place and his altars and commanded Judah and Jerusalem before one altar you shall worship and on it you shall burn your sacrifices? Do you not know what I and my father have done to all the people of other other lands, were the gods of the nations of those land at all able to deliver their hands uh, their lands out of my hands, who among all the gods of those nations that my uh, fathers devoted to destructions was able to deliver his people from my hands, and that your God should be able to deliver your uh, you from my hands now, therefore. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you or mislead you in this fashion, and do not believe, them, believe him. For no god of any nations or king kingdom has been able to deliver his people from my hands or from the hands of my uh, fathers. How much less will your god deliver you out of my hands? And his servants said still more against uh, uh, the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. And he wrote letter to the cast of contempt on the Lord, a God of Israel, and to speak against him, and saying, like the God of the uh, nations of the land who have not delivered their people from my hands, so the God of Hezekiah will not deliver his people from my hands. And they shouted it with a loud voice in the language of Judah to the people of Jerusalem who were on the walls, to frighten and terrify them in order that they might take the city. And they spoke of the God of Jerusalem, and they spoke of the God of the people of the earth, which are the work of the man's hands. So now you get the full pictures. Now, if we put Isaiah's story and the Second King story and Second Chronicles story, so now you get the full picture of what is happening and who said what and how they said it. So now you get the full picture. So when you put this together, now... It's a clearly the uh, um, Assyrian king invaded into Jerusalem. And before they actually came to Jerusalem, of course, they already destroyed the Samaria and north of Israel. So, Hosea, the last king of Israel, already destroyed and the city was all taken down. All the people were actually brought to Assyria and spread among the different, you know, uh, the areas. So, he was, you know, fully strengthened, and then he continued to invade it down to Jerusalem and is ready to take down the whole city of uh, uh, Jerusalem. So he was so proud, and he was actually just pumped up and said, like, have you ever seen any other countries or any other gods of those countries that I have invaded be able to actually save from my hand? No one. So what do you think your God be able to actually deliver you from my hand nope so he was very proud and he even said didn't god actually the one who sent me to destroy you well absolutely true that is actually true god is the one who actually brought the assyria to take down israel and also invaded into um, judah that was god's plan but the difference is this. It's like this. 
God told Assyria and said, My people and my king is not obeying to me. So you know what? Go and attack them and give them lessons. And then when you actually attack them, they will know I am the Lord. And they're going to cry it out to me. So God was trying to give them lesson and give them discipline. But instead, even though God is the one who sent the Assyria, Assyrian became so proud and they trusted in their power, their army, their stronghold, their weapons. So not just the discipline, but you know what? I'm going to just like cut you off. I'm going to destroy you completely. I'm not going to just leave anyone, you know, doing anything. I'm just going to destroy and destroy you entirely, which was not the God's plan. So they go beyond the, what the God plan and what, why, why God sent the Assyrian to uh, Israel and, and Judah. So one of the things that you can see here is when Assyrian king came over, what did Hezekiah do? Yes, he did trust it in the Lord, but at the same time, what did he do? He stripped the gold from the temple and from the palace. Because the Assyrian was actually asking for, I need you to give me just 300 talents of silvers and 200 talents of gold. So Assyrian was thinking he will not be able to actually bring that much of a gold and silver because that's a lots of gold and silver that you know he, the Assyrian king did not believe that Hezekiah would bring but he stripped every corners of the temple and the palace he dragged everything and then gave it to Assyrian and the Assyrian king was even surprised whoa 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 <laughs> you got lots of lots of silver and 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 gold what do you think the Assyrian's going to do well, well, look like you have a more. So I could, I just gonna, I just gonna go and collect myself. <laughs> I'm not gonna sit here and wait. I just gonna go and get myself, right? So even though he received a lots of gold and silver, that's not where he stopped. And it's I'm just gonna go and continue to go down, invade it into Jerusalem, and continue to pick it up, the the rest of the gold and silver. So. Now, after Hezekiah gave all the silver and gold, obviously, his plan did not work. The first plan was this. He actually went to Egypt. He went to Egypt, right? The reason that he actually stopped serving Assyrian was because he was relying on Egyptians, the Pharaoh. So the first mistake that Hezekiah made was he went to Egypt first and asked for help from Pharaoh first. Second mistake that he made was he was just relying on to strip down all the gold and silver from temple and palace and give it to uh, the Assyrian and hoping they will just, uh, you know, just, you know, withdraw from the land, which was not the case. So Hezekiah even though he was the man of a fate, what he did was he was relying on Egypt and he was also relying on the gold and silver that he gives to Assyria that, you know, this will protect them. And the third, which was what he did was now there's nothing left. Well, obviously, Pharaoh could not help him, nor the money was all gone. Now there's nothing left. What, did, what does he do now? There's nothing else for him to do. So he's now relying on the Lord because this is the last resort. So, as we have a scene, should that be the last resort? <laughs> it's always the first one. But we cannot blame Hezekiah because we do the same thing what Hezekiah does. Even though we know that we have to come to the Lord first, but that's not what we do. We normally do, you know, try to just to go to whoever we, you know, we can get the help from. After we exhaust all our options, 
then nothing worked, <laughs> then what do we do? Then we come to the Lord because there's nothing for me to do at this point, which is the wrong way of doing it. So when you think about it, even though Hezekiah is the, is the king who actually removed the uh, high places, he actually you know, uh, uh, guided the people to trust in the Lord, but he himself made a lot of mistakes too. Even though we believe that Hezekiah was a very faithful king, yes he was, but at the same time, he failed too. This is the one that I just kept mentioning to everyone. Bible does not teach us who to follow. We're not following Abraham. We're not following, you know, Isaac. We're not following, um, you know, um, Joseph. We're not following Moses. We're not following Joshua. We're not following David. We're not following any of those people. What is Bible teaching us? All mans are imperfect. We're fo we fall short. No one is perfect. So there's a lots of mistake that we see seen with even with the faithful people. Even David failed to actually rely on the Lord. He actually failed to serve the Lord and he did his own things. That's what Bible is teaching us. We're not following people, their trail. But Bible is teaching us, even though you are faithful, you are imperfect. That's why you need my help, because you will not be able to succeed. And same goes with the Hezekiah story. He's not perfect. Even though he was a faithful king, he made a lot of mistakes as well. So, let's go back to Isaiah again. <clears throat> Now turn to uh, chapter 37. As soon as the king Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shepna, the secretary and the senior priest, covered with sackcloth to the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, they said to him, Though says the Hezekiah, this day is the day of distress, of rebuke, and disgrace. Children have come to the point of birth, and there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God will hear the words of the uh, Rabshake, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to mock the living God, he will rebuke the words that the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. When the servant of a king, Hezekiah, came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to him, Say to your master, though says the Lord, Do not be afraid because the word that you have heard with which the young man of the Assyrian, uh, the, the king of Assyria have uh, revealed me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword of his own land. The Rabshake returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna, for he had heard that the king had left Lachish. Now the king heard concerning. Uh, Terhaka, king of Cush, he has set out to fight against you, and when he heard it, he sent messenger to Hezekiah, saying, Though shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of, uh, of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the king of Assyria have done to all lands, devoting them to destructions. And sh you, uh, shall you be delivered? Has the God of the nation delivered them, the nation that my father destroyed, uh, Gazan, Haran, um, Rezip, and the people of Eden who were in the Talasar? What is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of 
uh, Separvaim, the king of Ahena, or the king of uh, Iva. Hezekiah received a letter from the hand of the messenger and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, and throne above the cherubim, you are the, you are the God, you alone. Of all the kingdom of the earth, you have made heavens and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. And hear all the words of uh, Shana uh, Cherub, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the king of Assyria have laid waste all the nations that dear, uh, dear lands, and have cast your God into the fire, for they were... No gods, but the work of the man's hands, wood and stones. Therefore, they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. Now, finally, as I mentioned, he came to the Lord and asked for help. He just now have exhausted all the options. There's nothing left for him to do. So now God is the only one who could help him. Otherwise, either he will, you know, city will be destroyed and all people will be, you know, dead and he himself will be dead. So there's no other alternative. He looked around and there is no other options. So he actually come to the Lord and asked for help. And now he put on the sackcloth. When, <coughs> excuse me, when Israelites or the king put on the sackcloth, that means they now actually come to repentance and and they come and ask for you know forgiveness. So now he himself and asking for help, and now he's actually repenting before the Lord. Lord, I have done wrong. I have sinned against you, Lord. So he himself is repenting and coming to the Lord and Lord. I have no other options now. You're the only help I can get, Lord. Help me. So, imagine. Let's assume that. Think of this way. You have a friend. All right? You have a good friend. And then your friend needs some help. And you can help. But this friend goes to other places and other friends besides you. He seek for other help, and then he try all other his options and all other his friends, and he didn't get help that he need. Now he coming back to you at the last resort, and now asking for help. How would you feel? Would you feel like to help him with gladness and happiness? You wouldn't be. <laughs> you wouldn't be happy to help them. Because you were going to help them initially, and you could help them. And you know you could. But he excludes you, and he went around all other places. Now, after he exhausted all the options, he now coming back to you and I say, Hey, can you help me? Then what would you say? Even though you can help him, we don't feel like to help him because he ruins your feeling, right? You may help him, but you wouldn't be feeling good. You will be disappointed and you say like, why didn't you come to me? I could have helped you, right? You may help him, but you... You don't feel happy that he actually came to you at the last. You, he left you and then he went around all other friends who couldn't help him. And you knew that all other friends could not help him. But you're the only one who could help him. And he did not come to you. I need you to put that feelings and think about it from God's perspective. How would God feel when Hezekiah now come and I said, Lord, help me. How, how, you know, what do you think? I 
think it's a very like, well, 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 look who's here now. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But everything what Hezekiah had done disappointed the Lord. Hezekiah, I'm the one who, who can help you. I'm the one who sent the Assyrians. <laughs> you, you should have come to me first. Your people should come to me and learn why I'm sending this Assyrian to you. But people did not learn the lessons. As I mentioned, it's just Hezekiah or the Israelite did not learn. We did not learn either. We do the exactly same thing what Hezekiah had done and all other kings had done. We, we're no different than them. We cannot really judge what Hezekiah had done because this is what we, we would have done. But what I want you to know, as I kept saying throughout the Bible sharing, I want you to put yourself in God's shoes and how God would feel when we behave this way. Right? That's the kind of things that we have to learn. We always look at it from our own perspective. God, can, God is not doing this and God is not doing that. We always look at it from our perspective of looking up the Lord. Why didn't you respond? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? We always complain. But what we don't do is we don't put ourselves in God's shoes and how He feels when I behave this way. Always, when you read the Old Testament, doesn't matter which book you're reading, doesn't matter which chapter you're reading, I want you to put yourself in God's shoes before you determine, before you understand what this Bible is saying. And if you know, and if you feel God's feeling, and His disappointment, and His despair, you would understand why God is saying what he's saying, why God is doing what he's doing. <clears throat> but even though when our friends came to me and asked for help at last, you know, I was like, okay, I don't feel like to really help them, but I still help them. I still, I could have that feeling. Right? I, I can still help you. Even though I'm, you know, you hurt me, I can still help you, Right? But look at what God is doing. Listen to this. Chapter 37, verse 21. Pay attention to what, how God is responding. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Though, says the Lord, the God of Israel, because you have prayed to me concerning uh, Shinacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word of, that the Lord has a spoken concerning him. She despised you. She scorned you. The virgin daughter of Zion, she uh, wags her heads behind you, the daughters of Jerusalem. Whom have you mocked and revealed? Again, whom have you raised your voice and lift your eyes to the uh, heights? Against the Holy One of Israel. So now, go back here. What is God saying? When you look at verse 21, it says, Those says the Lord, the God of Israel, because you have prayed to me concerning Shinacherib, king of Assyria. Oh, you came to me. God is saying. So he's glad. God is so glad that he came to him. Do you see the disappointment here? Do you see him saying like, well, well, well. Now you're here. Do you see that? No. He's still glad that Hezekiah and the people of his, you know, Judah came to him and pray. When I read something like this, like for me, I don't get it. 
because that's not how I feel. You truly hurt me, man. How? How? Wh- why did? Why did you come to me? You know I could help you. You didn't come to me. Why not? I feel like hurt. This is the point. That's the difference between us versus our God. Even though we come to the Lord last minute, He accepts us. Do you remember the uh, um, the 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 person who? Uh, um, went to the field to get the, the, the workers in the mornings and the, uh, in the afternoons and um, uh, when he actually went to, um, to the field and to get the workers early on and then promised that I will give you the one talents and then you come and work in my vineyard. And then he went out in the uh, in the noons and he got another workers. And then he went out in the afternoon and he got another workers. And later, hour before the work is over, and then he brought the last you know guy, the workers in. And then when the time came, then he was about to give the wage to the all the workers who brought him in. And the the person who came in early in the morning and he was thinking, oh. The last guy who came in, the, you know, hour before the closing out the, all the work, and he got one talent. So, well, I must be getting at least like eight talents because I came in an early morning, right? That's exactly how we feel. Lord, I work longer hour. How come you're giving me the same talent as the guy who just came in last hour? And then he said, wait a second. Didn't I actually make a a promise that I will give you one talent when I called you in the morning? Isn't that the, isn't that what I promised you? So you got one talent. What's your complaint? Right? This is exactly how we feel. That like workers who came in early in the morning. It's not fair. <laughs> give me more. <laughs> right? I work much harder. I put more money. I put more time. I put more effort. Really? What about the what about what about I am the one who came at the last hour? Think about it. If I'm the one who came in last hour, would you be happy? So glad you only work for one hour, but you get the same wage as the guy who came in early in the morning? I'm so glad and happy. Wow, I got the same talent. But you know what? Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly, it is man's heart. That's exactly what's man's heart. You know what? Well, he's actually giving one talent, even the guy who came last. You know what? I'll come to the workplace at five minutes before it's closed out. Right? I just do all my you know, stuff, and then five minutes for closing, I come and I work for five minutes, I got one talent. I'm so happy. That's exactly man's heart. But you know what? Think about this. You love someone. You love someone. And you want to help that person. Because of, out of my, my own love. Is that what you will feel? That you will come in last minute and five minutes before the closing and then give five minutes of help? Or would you come and really help because you love that person? How would you feel? Are you thinking of the same thing? Even though you love, I'm just going to give like least amount of help that I can give? Or would you like to give as much help you can give? Which one? You don't have to answer me, but you know the answer, right? 
That's the difference between man's heart versus God's heart. God's heart is even the wicked does not want to be perished. Even the guy comes at the last minute, he will still save you. Isn't that what happened to the guy who was actually crucified right next to Jesus? Last minute, right before he died. Please remember me, Lord. Well, he's the one who came in last minute. What would Jesus do? Are you kidding me? Are you now? You're asking me to save you now on the cross? Right before you just take your breath? Uh, <laughs> forget it, man. You're done. It's over. That's not what Jesus do. Even though last minute, he will still accept you. That's the grace. That's the love that we see in the Bible. That's the difference between how man thinks versus how God thinks of us. That is the pure difference. Why we want to think about we're going to come in at last minute? Because we're the wicked one. Because we have no love. All we want is what I want. It's only out of a greed. But with love, it's different. God will do anything to accept you. This is why, even though Hezekiah, he just went around all their places and he came last to the Lord as, as a last resort, God still accept him. I'm so happy that you came to me. I'm so happy. Continue on. Verse 24 and on. By your servant you have mocked the Lord, and you have said, With my many chariots I have gone up the heights of the mountain to far recess of Lebanon, to cut down its tallest the Sidar, its choicest cypresses, to come to its uh, remotest height. It's most a fruitful for, uh, forest. I dug wells and drank waters to dry up with the soles of my foot all the stream of Egypt. Have you not heard that I determined it long ago? I planned from days of old what now I bring to pass, that you should make fortify the city crash into heaps of ruins, while their inhabitants, uh, shorn of a strength and dismayed and confounded, and have a become found the plants of the field and its tender grass like grass on the uh, house um, housetops. Belighted force, it is grown. I know you're sitting down and you're going out and coming in, and you're raging against me because you have raged against me, and your complaints, complacency has come to my ears. I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth, and I will turn you back on the way by which you came. And this shall be the sign for you. This year you shall eat what grows of itself, and in the second year what springs from that. Then in the third year saw and reap, and plant a vineyard, and eat deer fruits, and the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go to Remnant, and out to Mount Zion, the band of a survivor, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Therefore, though, says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, or shoot an arrow there, or come before it with the shield or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the, way, uh, the same he shall return, and he shall not come into the city. Declares the Lord, I will defend this, uh, this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. And the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Syrian, and when people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all the uh, dead bodies. Then 
Shinacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived in Nineveh. And he was worshipping in the house of um, Nisroch, his god, uh, Adra Melech, and uh, uh, Sharezer, his son, struck them down with the sword. And after they escaped into the land of uh, Ararat, uh, Asarhaddon, his son, reigned in his uh, place. So, God said, I'm, I am going to protect you. And I am going to give you the sign that I'm going to save you. So, what he said in verse 30, And this shall be the sign for you. This year shall you shall eat what grows of itself. And in the second year, what springs from that, then in the third year, saw and reap and the plant vineyard and uh, eat their fruit. And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. When you read this, this is what God allowed during the sabbatical year. This is what God does. And this is what God promised in Leviticus and Exodus and Deuteronomy. When the seventh year comes or the year of a jubilee, this is what I will do to you. Everything will be returned and back to normal after the sabbatical years or the, ju uh, the year of a jubilee. So restoration is what God is saying. So, because Hezekiah came and prayed, this is what God is promising, that he will restore. And he did restore. And what did he do? He sent what? One angel. One angel destroyed how many? 185,000. You don't need two angels. You don't need an army of angels. You just need one angel destroys 185,000. How powerful the angel can be. And then, whatever the Assyrians are saying, is like, who's going to protect, who's going to protect, you know, from my hands? They learned the lessons hard way right even though they said none of the gods that i invaded into were able to save from my hands but now when they came to jerusalem now they facing the real god which saves israel when you go back here take a look at this When you look at chapter 30, this is what God said. Isaiah chapter 30. Hang on one quick second, okay? We can read from verse 27. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar, burning with his anger, and in thick uh, rising smoke. His lips are full of fury, and his tongue is like a devouring fire. His breath is like an overflowing stream that reaches up to the neck to shift the nations with the uh, siege of a sieve of destructions and to place on the jaws of the people and brittle that leaves ashtray. You shall have a songs as in the night when holy feast is kept and gladness of heart as when one sets out to the sound of the flute to go to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel 
And the Lord will、uh, cause his ma-、uh, majestic voice to be heard and the descending blow of his arm to be seen. In the furious angels and a flame of devouring fire, with the cloud burst and storms and hailstorm, and the Assyrian will be terror stricken at the voice of the Lord when the strike with his rod and every stroke of the pointed staff that the Lord lays on them will be、uh, to the sound of tambourines and lyre. Battling with the、uh, Brandish arm, he will fight with them. For a burning place has long been prepared indeed for the king, is, it is made ready, its prey made deep and wide with fire and wood in abundance, and the breath of the Lord, like the stream of sulfur, kindles it. So God already promised that I am going to destroy the Assyria. I'm using Assyria as my rod to discipline you, but eventually, after I'm done, I'm going to destroy them because this is exactly what they're going to do. This is one of the things that I mentioned. When God leaves everything as it is and leaves up to the people, because we're wicked, we do more harm s than good. We destroy ourselves. This is who we are if God leaves it alone. Because of our own wickedness. All right, coming back. So, God protect them. Now, take a look at verse 31. And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again. Took root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and out of Mount Zion, the band of a survivor. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Whose zeal? The Lord's zeal will do this. Not because of you, because of my own zeal. Will fulfill this. And then he's going to cut the, the trunk. He's going to chop off the tree because the tree is actually rotten. Now he's going to regrow the tree from the stump. Remember, Matthew. Matthew. Chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. We're going to read from verse 7 and on. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You broad of vipers. Who, wor- who warns you to be flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourself, We have Abraham as our father. For I, will, as for I tell you, God is able from those stone to raise up children from Abraham. Even now, the X is laid to the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear fruit, good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What tree will be cut down? The tree that d o not bear any fruit will be cut down. So, this is exactly what God did. He literally he cut down the tree of Israel, and He's ready to actually axe the、uh, tree. Of Judah as well. Why? Because they're rebellious and they don't follow, they don't believe the Lord. So the remnant. So after he cut the trees down, he's not killing the tree. He wants the tree to regrow back. That's the ultimate goal. Because if you leave the trunk as it is, or you know, as it is rotten, it's not going to help the tree. In order for the tree to regrow, 
that tree has to be cut down and leave the root and leave the stump and then let the tree grow back. So God is about to actually cut the trees and he already did with Israel and he was about to cut the trees of Judah but because of the repentance because of he Ezekiel came to the Lord and he did not actually cut the trees but eventually he did right when did Israel fall BC 721 Israel was destroyed by the Assyrian but what about Judah when did Judah fall in Jerusalem BC 586 right by the Babylonian so it's about 150 years later that Judah was destroyed as well so eventually God also cut the trees of Judah as well but he waited for another 150 years I don't know if I can actually do chapter 38 within 10 minutes. <laughs> I don't think I can do that in 10 minutes. Um, so why don't we actually finish up to here, chapter 37 today, and then we'll continue on from uh, chapter 38 next week. Any questions?